Welcome to my talk on replicating memes from agent-driven selection. So what is a meme? Um, when we talk about memes in this talk, we're talking about self-replicating packets of information. And we mean this in the sense that they're identifiable. So you could actually talk about there being a certain number of copies. You could identify that two copies are the same. So um, rather than some kind of abstract uh, skill like how to sail a ship, it would be like how to tie the specific knot, or it could be a message or a picture, um, but something where you can actually count that you know, this thing is being duplicated or replicated. And we're interested uh, in this because it's a possible carrier for cultural learning. And that is to say um, the ability of like a society of agents to learn things collectively so that the information or the things that are learned persist beyond the lifespan of a single agent. Um, and the reason why we're interested in this kind of um, the specific identifiability is that if you have a, a copy mechanism or if you have replication, that implies the possibility for having evolutionary dynamics. Um, so in some sense, memes that are better can succeed and memes that are worse can fail and things like that. But the, the tricky thing is that um, meme fitness is not the same thing as host fitness or uh, a meme that is good at replicating is not necessarily the same as a meme that is beneficial to adopt. Uh, however, a possible point where this gets uh, interesting is that that can be affected by the host's cognition. So in genetic-based uh, evolution, in Darwinian evolution, you can't really use like the details of how things uh, process in, within the agent's lifetime in order, to, uh, in order to control the evolutionary process. So everything is bottlenecked by the number of offspring, basically. And all of the genes that an organism has are all assigned that credit kind of collectively. And you can have crossover and mutation to explore variations, but there's not a mechanism that says, okay, this one, you know, I had a really good day when I expressed this one protein. So let's make sure we keep this or something like that. But with memes, um, because they're being carried by an agent capable of cognition, they can be interpreted. And they can be interpreted in the context of experiences and things like that. So, you know, uh, an agent could have an idea and could go and try that idea out and could find that that idea, independent of everything else that that agent knows, worked for them or didn't work for them. And whether or not the agent is successful in the long term, they could, for instance, decide to communicate or teach those ideas that they judge successful. They could modify the ideas intentionally to be better at, at what the, whatever they're trying to do. So that's potentially. Um, uh, kind of a different kind of learning algorithm than the sort of thing that we use when we do genetic algorithms or when we train neural networks with gradient descent. And at least from the context of this talk, our interest is really in that kind of um, design of artificial societies as learning uh, systems rather than necessarily the natural science, uh, like how did how did memes actually emerge in, in humans or in, in animals? Um, and so a lot of what we're going to do is going to be to propose mechanisms to let us build artificial systems that might eventually exhibit this kind of learning, even if those mechanisms don't exist in reality. So we want to see these things emerge. We want to actually have a system that's capable of discovering different kinds of cognitive architectures for me, uh, for uh, social learning. And we want that to drive the emergence of some kind of replicating memes or replicating messages. So the, the key idea um, that we're going to kind of look at is what happens when the when the agents actually uh, can control the genetic evolution via something like mate selection um, in response to the signals that they receive within their lifetime. And we, we look at this because um, there's this kind of idea of runaway sexual selection that says that when you have a um, a very visible signaling trait, and you have a genetically encoded preference for traits for mate selection, there's a positive feedback where the signaling traits should become uh, more and more exaggerated. And with the this kind of communication equivalent of this, the idea would be maybe the agents would be just sending messages that aren't copies of what they heard. They're just sending you know random messages in response. But if an agent, um, if the messages were responsible for an agent's uh, probability of being selected for replication, then there could be a positive feedback where more recognizable messages would um, would become amplified, and then that would lead to sort of high fidelity copying rather than just uh, a very very high sort of mimetic mutation rate. 
So we're going to look at this with simulations, and our simulations exist on a grid. Um, all the agents, uh, each agent on the grid doesn't move; it just has its position, and it has uh, genetic parameters, which are the parameters of a neural network. It has a state, and it has a memory buffer. It broadcasts messages each uh, step and receives messages from the surrounding region, um, which is the dotted line here. And those enter that memory buffer. And then the neural networks process the memory buffer and the current state to update the state and also update the message that the agent is transmitting. Um, every, uh, every step, agents have a 10% chance of dying. So the average lifetime is about 10 steps. And when an agent dies, we pick a uh, another agent totally at random from within the broadcast radius, and that's the promoter. And then that promoter is going to look at its history of which messages it paid attention to and which ones it didn't. And it will pick an agent to promote on the basis of that. So agents that said things that it wanted to use are going to be uh, rated more highly and are more likely to be chosen to replicate. Those agents then replicate into the spot. So it's like a, an exaggerated form of sexual selection where actually the the promoter doesn't even get to contribute its own genetic material and only the only the selected agent does. Um, and that's not something that, for, as far as I know, exists in nature, but it is. Um, it gives us a stronger signal to look at the effects of this idea. The agents themselves are, neural, are attentional neural networks, um, and each of these three trapezoids is basically a, a set of neural network layers that have uh, that are parameterized, that have parameterized weights that are the genes of the agent. Um, each message in memory is processed into key vectors, and then the current hidden state is processed into a query. And the attention mechanism basically takes each of the messages in memory and says, how close is the query to that key? And then that gives it a weight um, between 0 and 1 that's, uh, that's normalized um, that will basically say, how much should that message contribute to the current sort of uh, perception of the agent? Uh, then we do a weighted sum. And then the selected message is fused with the hidden state to produce a new state and a new broadcast message, as well as to produce any kind of external behaviors in response to sensory information. But we also keep the weights, the attention weights, because those are used to decide who uh, to promote if the agent is picked as a promoter. Um, and we can add this extra skip connection here, which will basically say that the broadcast message is going to have a bit of a bias. If this neural network didn't do anything, the skip connection says the broadcast message should be similar to the to the sort of weighted average of memory. Um, and that will bias the system towards more replicative behavior. But we find that uh, this speeds things up, but it's not strictly necessary. We can see replicative behavior without it. Um, so how are we actually going to detect this behavior? One thing we can do is we can uh, freeze the uh, genetic evolution and make a grid with a bunch of identical agents, but then give them different messages and see what the dynamics look like. And we can see various motifs. One motif is that there might be a fixed point, which is just the genes say, always say this message. And in that case, we would see the grid as a whole move to uh, adopt that message kind of uniformly um, without any kind of spatial effect. Another thing we can see is that there might be a message that's very strongly salient. Um, so other agents want to pay attention to it. But the response of those agents to that message isn't also salient. It, it's not something that propagates any further. And in that case, we'll see these kind of frozen regions um, that are about the size of the uh, transmission radius. But what we're really looking for is something like these blob, like the um, pink and green blobs, where as the simulation proceeds, the boundaries of that blob expand, and they expand in their color. Um, so it's not just one thing that's taking over, but we actually could see multiple different things that are expanding. That suggests that those messages are autocatalytic, that they're causing themselves. So here's an example with two different random initializations. In the top case, we actually do see something that looks like local spread, but it's a bit more complicated than the previous picture. Here we have three messages, each of which causes the next in a kind of rock, paper, scissors pattern. So A causes B, causes C, causes A. And that's giving us this sort of oscillation, the spiral defect chaos. In the bottom, we see this kind of static message motif. So even the random initialized networks, and these don't have skip connections, can give um, positive feedback or replication. It just doesn't always do so. If we evolve it for a while, um, here I've done 2,000 steps of evolution. Then I've taken one of the networks, made a uniform grid with only that network, and then randomized the messages and let them propagate. Um, we see much smoother kind of spatial uh, behaviors. And that's a, a much more um, you know that's a repeated pattern now. Uh, here we have like four or five messages um, that are kind of spreading locally and displacing each other. 
what if we want to look for more evolutionary dynamics? Because this is just saying, all right, for once we've done 2,000 steps of evolution, we had those five messages, but it didn't look like they were actually continuing to evolve. What happens when the genetics and the mimetics are really tightly coupled for a long period of time? For this, we're going to try to do something like a mimetic phylogeny. And here, we, because each of the messages, we discretize them, um, we can tell like whether there are two copies of the same message or not. So we keep track of all of the messages, all of the unique messages. And if a given message has more than 20 copies in the system, we draw a yellow dot. Otherwise, we leave it uh, purple. And we can kind of see that there's the succession of new messages being discovered, um, as well as some of the old messages actually stick around for a long time, even though the new ones are kind of moving. And that, that's a bit unusual for an evolutionary, um, for genetic evolutionary process in the sense that um, for things for evolution on uh, static fitness landscapes, you expect to see competitive exclusion. And uh, competitive exclusion is this process where the fittest quasi species will cause all the other species in the system to go extinct in a time that's kind of logarithmic with the population size. So, quite quick um, compared to the time scales we're seeing here. Uh, so this is more what you'd expect from a system with multiple niches or some kind of like novelty or quality diversity uh, kind of thing going on to preserve the diversity. But here, the interagent selection seems to be enough to do it. Um, we want to test whether the interagent selection is actually responsible for this, so we turn it off. And then we see that, in fact, the uh, although we do still have five or six replicators or at least a high, high pattern count uh, messages, we don't really see an increase with time of those. Um, so neutral genetic drift is not enough to cause what we're seeing. And, and what's eventually happening where all of these kind of go dead is that there are individual networks in the system that are um, maybe replicating one message or broadcasting one message, but you no longer have a high copy number because you know each network is genetically totally different than every other one. So you just have a bunch of random messages. When we have the selection, it causes the system to organize into these kind of patches um, that are talking to themselves. And we start to see the emergence of, you know, new, of newer memes. And it's probably driven uh, to a large part still by genetics, um, but we actually do see uh, uh, you know, new messages that dominate the system at different points in time. And here in half the time of the top simulation, we have like 15 messages, whereas we had like five or six in the top. Um, with the skip connection, it's much faster. And so in the same amount of time, now we have hundreds of messages and we have this real, almost like an ecological succession going on. So in conclusion, um, the actual replication property of messages is not that rare, even in randomly initialized agents that are not strictly biased towards it. But having this inter-agent selection pressure on the genetic uh, evolution encourages this kind of uh, diversity cascade. Um, so it's as if we're transiting from uh, from just having memes to actually having something more like mimetic evolution, although there is still an important genetic component to this process. And from this point, you know, kind of going on, we have to answer the question, how do we actually learn this credit assignment mechanism? Um, because right now we don't have any kind of external task. But even if we did, there's this problem that one host might experience multiple memes in its lifetime, and one meme could be spread across multiple hosts. So how do you actually learn which memes are responsible for success on a task? And how do you learn the kind of cognitive architectures that will, will make that thing drive the mimetic evolution? Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to say and hope to talk more about this at the uh, panel discussion. Thanks.